We are all Federalists. We are all Republicans. You know, these are healing words, important words that come from Thomas Jefferson's first inaugural address. You know, he's elected in 1800 in one of the more contested and uh, contentious elections in the country's history. And, you know, in 1801, he stands before Congress and he delivers these words. And they have great meaning. You know, you'll, have no, you'll know from having read your textbook that, you know, the latter half of the 1790s, many of Washington's greatest fears, right? Would the revolution survive the death of the great man had come to be realized. They were coming to fruition, especially around partisanship, where we have the Federalist Party in control, using laws like the Alien and Sedition Act, Francophobia, Anglophobia, all of these things to sort of drive out the oppositional party, including imprisoning them for standing up against the government. And, you know, when Jefferson is elected, there's a lot of thought that there's going to be a counter-terror, that he will use his power now, and now that his party's in power, to drive out the Federalists, right, to abuse power. And he doesn't do this. You know, the election of 1800, in many ways, and we'll talk about these ways, is the triumph of the revolution. Many of the final uh, key points that have been in contest will be resolved and will move forward. And when Jefferson says, we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans, he's offering forgiveness of a sort. He is saying, I accept the existence of an oppositional party as necessary, and proper to a functioning democracy, right? That oppositional thought and political opponents are reality. He lets the Alien and Sedition Acts expire. He doesn't contrive to misuse the law and his power to drive out his opposition, right? To promote his ideology. Now, that being said, make no mistake, Jefferson is an ardent, ambitious, and driven partisan. He goes to great length to say, yes, I accept your existence, but I am going to drive you out through legal means, through proper means, through competition. Uh, you know, one of the first things he does is that when John Adams, in the last uh, moments of his presidency, had all these appointments, right, on his way out, these midnight appointments, Jefferson refuses to acknowledge any of them. And in fact, every opportunity, every chance he gets, every court seat, every staff position, he puts not just uh, a Democratic Republican, but an ardent, you know, motivated Democratic Republican. And really, the Federalist Party, after this moment, will become really a very regionalized party, limited mostly to New England, and their uh, power will continually shrink. And by the 1820s, they all but disappear, right? And except for John Marshall, Chief Justice on the Supreme Court, uh, very little else of the Federalist vision is kept alive, right? So Jefferson is an ardent uh, partisan and an effective one, right? The, the Democratic Republicans become the dominant national party, mostly through the efforts of Jefferson. But, but part of what he's doing, he has a vision for a republic, and it starts with not using counter-terror, not using ideological warfare to drive out your opponents. We accept bipartisanship as part of, a, of, of an effective and liberty-loving democracy. So Jefferson strives to save the revolution. And along with accepting oppositional partisanship and competing vigorously and effectively to promote his own party, the Democratic Republicans, uh, he also saves, he also strives to save the revolution from the ideology and the policies of the Federalists which had been dominant all through the 1790s. And in order to uh, sort of frame this discussion, as I like to do, I'm going to draw on the work of, uh, of a historian, another historian I like, uh, a historian named Drew McCoy, who wrote one of the more uh, persuasive and thoughtful analyses of Thomas Jefferson's historical sense of himself, 
his revolutionary ideology, his enlightenment optimism, and how all of those found their way into his actual practical and pragmatic policies as president. Um, the book I'm referring to is called The Elusive Republic. The Elusive Republic, and it's, it's a wonderful book. And the way he looks at it is this, is that he says, you know, Jefferson had a few very key elements of federalism that he felt required his active undoing, right? That he had to really make an effort to get rid of. A lot of it had to do with this, this whole federalist idea of trying to model the early American government, the government of the United States, after the government of England, right? That England was serving as this model. You know, one of it was just sort of structurally, this, this idea that, you know, the Federalists would set up this sort of court of elite, talented men who, you know, were revered for, for their merit, but they were still a small elite group governing on behalf of others, right? That sort of classical Republican idea. Whereas Jefferson really wanted much more of a liberal Republican idea, right? To really bring in more uh, of, the, of the common individual and, and to promote them in this larger government. So he didn't like this sort of elite court model of, of an English government. And more importantly than that, what he really and specifically didn't like was the way we were mimicking the, the, the English economic system. This way that the government was directly involved in promoting finance and banking and manufacturing and urban growth. You know, all of those visions of, of Alexander Hamilton, right, that, it, that had come to fruition during the 1790s. You know, Jefferson saw these, he didn't see them as practical, he saw them as corrupting. You know, he said, if we really look at European society. He goes, I don't want to be like European society. It leads to large urban centers with huge differentiations of wealth, a very wealthy group, and large amounts of landless uh, dependent workers, right? This, uh, in his mind, it led to, you know, governments with too much power and dependency. This is a real idea for Jefferson, this idea that too many people under those systems, especially in a growing urban manufacturing based system, are dependent. They are not self-sufficient. And large groups of dependent individuals are a real problem for democracy, right? That people be motivated by their passions instead of their intellect and their reason. And this isn't just ideological for Jefferson. He says it's practical. He goes, there are more riots. There is more crime. There is less food security in England and in France, right? That their governments are more tyrannical. And it's a result of the sort of government they've developed. And ideologically, what Jefferson will promote, and he will do this both, like I said, as an ideology, but also in practical terms, is this idea of the philosophy of agrarianism. Philosophy of agrarianism, which we talked about a bit in an earlier lecture. But I'm gonna say it again, that this idea that Republican virtue and the democracy of an individual and a nation, right, is best promoted and preserved if most people were market-oriented farmers. And that's important, all that entire term. Not just farmers and not just market-oriented, market-oriented farmers, right? The idea that if you owned land and you made it productive using just enough of your rationality, your forethought, your understanding of, of global economics and hard work and skill, that you would apply that to your land, you could engage in these foreign markets and make a decent living. Own a piece of, of the country, make the country better through your intellect and your hard work. This is the essence of what Jefferson wants in his republic. He says it's not just idealized, it really is the best thing for a democracy because Embedded in it is this idea of independence, right? That individuals and families own the land, make it, depend, make it uh, productive, and they achieve not just a nobility, which is part of it, there's a bit of a mythical nobility in this, but true independence, right? They don't rely on someone else for their sustenance, for their pay, right? They are the best sort of people. When they participate in a democracy, they'll do it not as people who are desperate or dependent on someone to give them something, but because they want what's best for farming, for markets, for their family, for the future, right? 
That's the essence, that Republican virtue is inseparable from lifestyle and work choices. Right? He said they have to go together. And, you know, the opposite of this, right, is what these uh, governments of Europe, where you, you wed together high finance and subsidizing of manufacturers and promotion of urban growth, relocation of, of rural people to cities, right, which creates, yes, a, a fairly powerful nation state capable of waging global war, right, and, and great levels of wealth, but it also created massive amounts of dependency, these ever-growing masses of, of low-skilled, non-land-owning, non-property-owning, uneducated urban workers, right, whose numbers grow and grow and grow. And this leads to instability, to riots, to crime, right? This is, you know, was fairly well known in Jefferson's time. It's well known in our time, right? There is a problem with dependency. And Jefferson felt the way to combat that, that America, you know, especially for a democracy, because those who are dependent, and this is really the key, are more likely to be swayed by their passions, right? To, be, to give in to a demagogue who promises things or manipulates their wants to aggrandize themselves for power. I mean, that's the big fear of all democracies. Whereas market-owning farmers, uh, market-oriented farmers are far more likely to be rational in their approach to democracy, right? That, that connection between self-reliance and independence versus dependence, right, is, is really at the heart of what will keep Republican virtue alive for Jefferson. And I, I, I want to just say one other thing to sort of add to this. Uh, why market-oriented farmers? Another thing. A lot of Americans are subsistence farmers at this time. And while Jefferson said that's better than being, you know, a low-skilled wage worker in a city, right, you are able to own property and you are more or less self-reliant, you know, for Jefferson, it wasn't enough. He felt that, you know, you would lack ambition, you would be provincial, you'd be less educated. You know, he wants his land-owning Democratic farmers to be wise, to have a broader view of their efforts, right? That is, it's not enough just to be independent. That's the first step. But this idea of creating national conditions that promote not just subsistence farming and land ownership, but market farming, rational participation in global markets, this will underpin the greatest successes of the Jefferson presidency. So I'm going to back this up a little bit because there's kind of a theoretical and ideological uh, world that Jefferson is directly responding to. And I just feel it's important to, to understand it, to place this within the enlightenment of which Jefferson is, is very much a part and means to be a part. And it shows us the way being both uh, an Enlightenment thinker and leader, as well as a practical leader, could mesh together during this period of time. So in the 1760s, Benjamin Franklin, America's Enlightenment leader, uh, is living in Europe. And while doing many different things in Europe, one of the things he does is he writes an analysis of why it seems great European societies always uh, result in what he called decay, right? Why do they seem to devolve? They seem to go through this period of great success and, you know, growing wealth. And then all of a sudden, they seem to shift towards tyranny. Urban success turns into urban overpopulation, right? And they begin to have more problems than successes, right? That the bottom end seems to get more unstable, more dependent, sort of a decaying civilization. Like what causes civilizations to go from youth to maturity to this old age and decay. And as a typical Enlightenment thinker, he kind of observes what he sees in London and Paris and reads other Enlightenment works, and he sort of pens together this analysis. And he says, well, there are two categories of causes, right? And one, he says, are natural causes of decay, right? And they, these natural causes are more or less unavoidable. And they're exactly what you think, is that as a country becomes more successful, settles more of its land and cultivates it, right? Sure, the population is going to grow, but you always hit this point, especially when you have really hard defined national boundaries where the amount of cultivated land and the yield you can pull off of that land um, 
is outstripped by population growth, that the population grows faster than the resources the land can produce. And at this period of time, you'll see, you know, a huge swing towards urbanization, an uh, ever expanding, you know, growth in independent, landless, low skill workers, you know, moving to cities. And that this sort of natural cause is really one of the great driving forces behind the decay of all civilizations. But he also points to what he calls artificial decay. And artificial decay uh, mostly is about societal and government structures that promote corruption, right? Uh, tyrannies, uh, things that privilege small groups to the um, exclusion of large groups, right? Luxury living. All these sort of things, you know, those who would take advantage of this ever large growing group of landless poor for self-aggrandizement, right? These were seen um, as the artificial causes of decay, right? Corruption being the key word. And this is pretty widely accepted. Most people would agree with Franklin. And many of the leaders of the revolution uh, would look at these two causes, natural decay and artificial decay, and say, yeah, natural decay seems somewhat inevitable, but we can actually do something about artificial decay. And in fact, the revolution itself focuses on this, this artificial causes of decay, right? That's what they're attacking. The corruption of a monarchy, right? And, and uh, the need for self-rule and virtue, right? How do we get virtue? That's, that's all under this artificial decay, a way to keep your country, prolong its youth and its, and its vigor. Um, there's one key thinker who Jefferson actually writes a long response to, and, and it's, it's probably one of the most popular thinkers on this idea of natural decay, and that is a Britishman named Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus. And in fact, uh, his theory is so prevalent, it's called Malthusianism, and sometimes it's referred to as the Malthusian trap. And what Thomas Malthus said was this. He said, yeah, it's illusory to think that you can attack these artificial causes of decay and somehow forestall uh, the devolution that awaits all civilizations, right? He says these natural causes, right? The fact that um, all societies ultimately run headlong into the inability to produce enough food to deal with their population growth within a confined boundary. He says that's, that's an inescapable reality. Everything else is illusory. This is what awaits all of us. You know, he's one of the very few pessimistic Enlightenment thinkers. You know, both the Enlightenment thinker, thinkers found some way towards optimism or a better future, or a way to change things for the better. Malthus is a determinist and a biological determinist at that, so it's almost inescapable. In fact, um, he had a, a, a great way of saying this. He said, the irrepressible passions between the sexes results in a geometric population growth, whereas the supply of food and the means of nourishment could only increase arithmetically, right? And by geometric, he means exponentially. And specifically, he says that, you know, no matter what history we look at, from Rome to France to England, the same thing happens, right? You have this great youth as you expand and settle and cultivate your land. You, cre you create new techniques that increase yield, populations grow, people move to cities and manufacturing begins to happen. But soon, uh, as population, you know, because of this cultivation of lands grow faster and faster, you can't meet that need. And you will always have, all of a sudden, this huge expanding group of low-leveled, uh, unskilled, propertyless workers who are hungry and desperate and meeting their needs leads to corruption, leads to decay, leads to tyranny, right? Leads to all these problems. He says it's an inevitable stages, and he sets this as the stages of all civilizations and countries, a youth, a, mi a middle age, and then what he calls old age. And as he looked at, you know, Europe in the late uh, 18th century, which, you know, is, is war-torn and, and is the rise of these powerful nation states, he says, yeah, they're all in this old age, right? That's what's causing all this instability. And he said specifically, he even talks about America. He says, you know, America in its youth, yeah, it has incredible amount of land, but eventually the same unavoidable natural cause of decay will come to America as well. It's just a matter of time. Now, Jefferson, as I said, actually responds to Malthus, you know. Uh, it, it, he actually writes treatises about Thomas Malthus and why Malthus is wrong. And as president, 
he actually is able to begin policies that address the concerns of Malthus. You know, Jefferson is the ultimate optimistic Enlightenment thinker, certainly in the American sense. And he felt he could create practical policies that would combat both the artificial and natural causes of decay, because he believes they're both real. And in doing that, he would restore and preserve the sort of virtuous heart of the revolutionary republic. He said, you know, the problem with the Federalists was they were creating these artificial causes of de decay, right? Their style of government is one of those artificial causes. And that was pretty easy to address, right? That was immediately, was basically the election of his party. Um, you know, yes, he accepts the existence of an oppositional political party, but he would go on to promote his party in every position he could. They would increase state rights. He would get the government out of the business of investing in manufacture. They would refuse to inv invest it all in um, what he called internal improvements. You know, all things like canals and, and road building was done with private money. He wouldn't get involved in it. Um, you know, he would not do anything that promoted urban growth or urban manufacturing. He would keep taxation low. You know, all of these ideas of sort of reducing the size of this powerful and potentially corrupt English-style government. That's actually was pretty easy to address in terms of this point in time. And that's how Jefferson addresses the artificial causes. He would even go uh, also uh, pursue Washington's vision of no entangling alliances, right? Because he understood that we had to have these commercial relationships with everybody uh, without getting involved in their quarrels and their political uh, battles and their wars. The second part, and this is really, which would, which would address both the artificial causes of decay and specifically the natural causes, was something very concrete. He knew we needed to have unobstructed access. America had to have unobstructed access to vast amounts of free land. And not just to get the land, but really important in terms of just having land was securing navigable rivers, rivers you could sail up and down and reach ocean-based ports, to secure por ports, to explore and settle and develop coastlines, right? It basically, to take this huge, vast North American continent and bring it into the nation state rationally and effectively. And the reason you want to do this is because this is how you create market farmers. There's two things they need. They have to have land, right? This free supply of land. He understood from the Northwest ordinances how valuable this really could be, how this keeps Republican virtue alive. We really do have this massive amount of land. And secondly, it's not just the land, because he doesn't want them just to be backwoods subsistence farmers. Part of this vision is you have to have a real sense of geographic space and shape and possibility. Securing the rivers and the coastlines, right, all the way to the Pacific, because we have to take this huge chunk of land that's presently unsettled by Americans, make it productive, and have a way to take that produce, those productive elements, and ship them into these global markets, right? And it sounds simple enough, but he really has a very concrete way he goes about doing this. In fact, it becomes the policies of America roughly for the next hundred years. You know, the way he says about Malthus, he says, you know, Malthus is too pessimistic. And the real problem with Thomas Malthus is this. He says he's too European. He's got a completely European notion of space and geography with these really hard to find national boundaries or island states like England, right? He says, yeah, what he doesn't really understand is how vast the continent of North America is, how massive our coastlines are, how huge the opportunities are for market farming in America. He says he can't begin to understand. You know, the way that um, Thomas Paine made that argument in common sense that America is truly a continental nation, right? Different from all of Europe, that its, its size and its massiveness creates a whole different level of possibilities for freedom. And again, Jefferson sees this as not just ideological, but practical, that, you know, Malthusianism, in fact, he, he converts the Malthusian trap of Europe to being part of his practical plan for preserving liberty in America. He says, you know what? You're right. 
in Europe, you are suffering old age. You are at the end stage of this Malthusian trap. You have a lack of food security and large urban dependent populations without secure food sources. America will preserve its liberty by being the market producers of farm goods for old age Europe. And in fact, we do. Jefferson's presidency and every presidency after that goes to great lengths to establish and maintain America's market trade of farm and agricultural goods to Europe, right? He says that in fact, it's a symbiotic relationship. He takes the, the sort of absolute pessimism of Malthus and makes it sort of this optimistic market view where America has this incredible amount of untapped land, untapped navigable rivers and, and coastlines and ports. And as we develop that, we will be able to forestall the development of manufacturing and cities and urban squalor because we'll make our money by selling that produce to people who've already reached old age, who've reached this you know, age of manufacturing and urban overcrowding. Right? It's the perfect relationship in this war-torn Europe with Napoleonic armies raging across Europe. I mean, this is, you know, it's real. He's actually, he's actually not wrong. Right? His vision is correct. And specifically, the way he does this is this acquiring of massive amounts of land. You know, in 1803, Jefferson has one of the greatest moments of his, of his presidency. We acquire the Louisiana Purchase, right? The Louisiana Purchase. We buy it from France. And, you know, to think about the size of this, it is basically uh, all of the valleys in the regions that feed into the Mississippi River and the Missouri River, right? These two giant navigable drains of the interior of continental America that flow out to the Gulf of Mexico. You know, it's the Great Plains, it's Oregon, it's the upper Midwest, it's chunks of big sky country, right? It's this huge, he more than doubles the size of America. And not only doubles the size in just getting land, but the land he gets is fed by these great rivers, navigable rivers all across it that feed into the Missouri and the Mississippi and connect us to these global markets, you know, out through, through Louisiana into, into the Gulf of Mexico. Jefferson will make the exploration and the charting and the rationalization and, and the understanding of the Louisiana Purchase, you know, a ground zero policy for him. He knows how important this is. That's the, why we have Lewis and Clark and why we begin to think of ourselves, you know, the, the sense of America is about settling these big spaces and cultivating them and making them the home of sort of rationalist market farming, right? It, it is this relief valve for Eastern overcrowding. And this vision is aided again and again over the next hundred years. You know, uh, the Mexican Cession, 1848, another massive, you know, we, we fight this war against Mexico and after which we annex Texas. Uh, we take all of the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico. We get California and Colorado and uh, parts of Montana and Wyoming. All that comes from the Mexican Cession, right? It's a huge expansion. Uh, after that, 1867, we have something called Seward's Folly, right? Where uh, Secretary of State Seward is able to buy from the Russians Alaska, this massive frontier, which they called a folly because everyone thought it was a frozen wasteland, but they were wrong. As we know, it is, you know, full of almost uh, unimaginable amount of uh, extractable natural wealth. And he buys it for like two cents an acre. Huge expansion. You know, after 1898, American territorial, you know, we'll, after a war with Spain, we'll gain holdings in the Caribbean and, and throughout uh, the Pacific Ocean, right? We bring in Hawaii. You know, the American territorial expansion over the next hundred years does in fact happen, right? We do end up with these huge chunks of land and market agriculture and extractive natural resource economies will absolutely underwrite American national success, a certain amount of American independence, American market agriculture as, as this sort of defining aspect of being American and access to land, right, for the next hundred years and, and beyond. You know, in that, Jefferson is correct. His vision was in part right. He does define America as something very different from what's happening in Europe, then or now. And it has everything to do 
with acquiring this space that Thomas Malthus really couldn't understand. And he doesn't just get the land, he gets the land, the navigable rivers, the coastlines, he knows how to develop it, and ensuing uh, administrations and, and presidents would do the same, right? And in effect, certain elements of Republican liberty are preserved by this. We do forestall a long, long period of times, until really very modern times, right? Rapid urban manufacturing growth. This is part of America, right? This does define America through this period. That Jefferson's vision is, you know, is, is somewhat correct. It does help address both the artificial and the natural causes of decay. And for right now, I just want to point out that this is, this is one of those great moments for Jefferson. You know, Jefferson is, is such a confusing and confounding historical figure in American history. And yes, as we talked about, he had those, those moments of smallness and weakness that presaged long-term American problems, sectionalism and slavery being the two biggest, of which Jefferson, as big as he was, wasn't bigger than that. And yet there's the other side of Jefferson. The idealistic uh, and pragmatic enlightenment thinker, right, who was able to shape American policies, ideas about neutrality, about commercial relationships, about expanding, as he said, the way we defeated the Malthusian trap is America has the ability to expand across space without advancing in time, right? We could preserve this idea of Republican virtue through land access and commercial farming and extraction far longer than anyone could imagine. And in some ways, it's very, very true. This is the best of Jefferson. However, I want to come back to the historian Drew McCoy. Drew McCoy's book, as I said, is called The Elusive Republic, right? This idea, this empire of liberty that Jefferson was trying to build doesn't come to full fruition, right? The truly idealized and idealistic world doesn't happen. Elements of it survive. American uh, aspects of American exceptionalism are absolutely embedded in this. This massive acquisitions of land, the way it's converted and, and settled from Jefferson's Northwest ordinances up to the Homestead Act and beyond. However, what Jefferson didn't really consider is that this territorial expansion, the securing and charting and management right, and development of all of this territory, the securing of ports, the development of coastlines, right, the, um, the creating of uh, durable commercial relationships in a world that was mostly full of closed hostile economies, right, all of that took a massive expansion in the powers of central government, right. In many ways, first and foremost, we needed an expanded powerful, professional military, right? Sustained expanses and, and expansion in military and spending on military and the raising of taxes to make that happen is also a major part of this story, right? I mean, the Civil War, right, is, 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 is fought in large part over settling the Mexican cession. Would it be a slave, would it allow slavery or not, right? Um, the War of 1812 is really, in many ways, about being able to exploit the Louisiana Purchase. And, you know, the whole great open space wasn't really open. It is full of Native Americans, right, who were, who were pushed off their lands through military means. And securing ports all the way through, you know, uh, the, war of, uh, the war with Spain, you know, this is all required a massive expansion in government. And also just the bureaucracy it takes to manage all of this, to settle it, the taxation it takes to develop it. You know, eventually, you know, Jefferson and later Madison's ideas of not investing uh, in internal improvements, well, that's thrown to the wind. America gets very much involved in investing money in roads and canals and railroads, right? That this is very much the story of how we convert this land into uh, market land that we could settle. And so what makes his vision ultimately elusive is the very government, right, that he was trying to get rid of, the sort of artificial government of the Federalists, ultimately because of the policies he pursues, because of this massive continent, we try to make a land for Republican virtue and farmers requires a dynamic, powerful, centralized, bureaucratic government 
as envisioned by men like Hamilton and the Federalists. And what this ultimately means for us now, I don't know. It's a little unclear. We have to look at the different elements. Which elements of Republican virtue? Which aspects of the artificial causes of decay have we forestalled? Which elements of natural decay, the natural causes, and the artificial causes are still with us today? That's what's left for us to think about. Thank you.